Welcome, everybody. This is WNM's annual emission inventory reporting webinar, uh, January 19, 2017. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, if you need to get off or stop, it'll be available later on so that you can review it. Thanks everybody for attending. My name's Andy Adams. I'll be uh, the moderator for the discussion. Uh, we're joined by three experts from WNM and myself. Mike Faudry possesses over 35 years of diverse experience in effectively dealing with stakeholder and the stakeholders in the industrial, utility, renewable, commercial, and government sectors. This experience encompasses strategic regulatory planning, permit strategy development, energy and sustainability consulting, civil engineering, and construction management. While that is inclusive, Mike has also been heavily involved in air projects uh, with the Clean Air Act since uh, he began doing environmental work uh, in the 80s. Mike leads the WNM Corpus Christi operation. Jennifer Adams is an environmental scientist with over 10 years of experience in environmental compliance as a senior environmental scientist for the industrial sector. Coming from industry, she has project experience with regulatory reporting, including Tier 2 toxic release inventory reporting, emission inventory reporting, and greenhouse gas reporting. She has worked on many air permit application projects for permits by rule standard air permits, and new source review permits. She has also spent time working with a site subject to Title V and NESHAP requirements. Ms. Adam leads WNM's Austin office operations. Brandon Clayton is a WNM Environmental Group's technical air specialist. Mr. Clayton has 10 years of experience in a variety of environmental projects. After graduating from college, Mr. Clayton spent three years working for the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality as an emissions evaluator, working on observing stack tests and performing report reviews for numerous oil and gas facilities, power plants, and numerous types of industrial and manufacturing facilities and plants. Since working for the TCEQ, Mr. Clayton has worked on projects including permit by rules, new source review, uh, and Title V permitting, air emission calculations, annual emission inventories preparation, and reporting in numerous states, including Texas, Oklahoma, Michigan, Louisiana, Minnesota, Michigan, Indiana, Missouri, Mississippi, Wisconsin, and a few numerous others. Mr. Clayton resides in the Houston, Texas office. Finally, myself, I'm an environmental fate and transport chemist with over 12 years of experience in a wide range of environmental projects. I'm recognized and published in expertise in fate transport and degradation of environmental pollutants. And I tend to consult in the field of integrated site closure for large industrial petrochemical manufacturing and oil and gas facilities. The obvious question should probably be why I'm here. And the answer to that is I'm going to moderate this session as you hear from the three experts. Just to comment on the presentation, this is going to be a high-level presentation. Uh, as many of you, I'm sure, are familiar, these are pretty complex issues with actually reporting emission inventories. If after this presentation you want to get into the weeds with one of our three experts or maybe all of them, um, please give one of the experts a call and we can arrange that. Just quickly, a little bit about WNM. Uh, WNM Group is an innovative consulting firm providing, providing value-added strategies for industrial, public sector, petroleum, chemical, and real estate clients, enabling them to minimize risk and to successfully complete business transactions. Our purpose as a firm uh, for all of you is we try to simplify and solve complex environmental problems. Uh, services include air permitting and reporting, compliance and permitting, uh, safety compliance and industrial hygiene, closure of contaminated properties, 
engineering, remediation, wetlands, and many more. Um, if we can help, please do not hesitate to reach out. Quickly, the agenda for this webinar. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the regulatory background and why, why the emission inventory exists. Uh, we're going to address who needs to report. We're going to talk about components of reporting. We'll enter into the effective, effective reporting implementation and things that will help through that process. Uh, reporting tips. We'll cover amendments to the rule and also some, some industry changes that have occurred in the last year. Uh, and then we'll give you some resources that you can reach out to. So starting into the regulatory background, the emission inventory is part of the enactment of the Clean Air Act. It also is codified in the Texas Clean Air Act uh, under the Texas Health and Safety Code, and that's in section 382.014. Uh, it's also used in Title 30 of the Texas Administrative Code, often referred to as TAC. That's in subsections 101.10, and that's entitled EI requirements. Uh, from the Title 30 TAC 101.10, the emission inventory is designed to plan pollution control programs, promote compliance with laws, and regulations, conduct permit reviews, develop airshed modeling and rulemaking activities, and supply required data to the US EPA. While these regulations put pressure on commerce to track these emissions, the data has provided has been that has been provided has become important data in advancements and achievements in air quality. Uh, this data is actively used to help decrease air pollution covered under the Clean Air Act. The two pictures below from the TCEQ show the decrease in air pollution in large Texas cities. And just to add this, I'm in Houston. Uh, we have an office in Houston. Houston now has many less days of ozone exceedance um, compared to LA, which it was once uh, far above days exceeded compared to LA. Point being, the Texas state implementation plan has worked, uh, and the EI data is the tool that we develop those SIPs from. Additionally, uh, there are regions of the reporting requirements. Uh, this is in the other picture. Um, and they are also ranked with severity. And that picture is on the TCEQ uh, Emissions Inventory website. Um, Mike, can you give us some perspective to what the present day emission inventory is used by regulatory agencies? Uh, thank you, Andy. Um, as you mentioned above, uh, it's an essential tool to the regulatory agencies for planning, uh, you know, air quality efforts, as well as implementing the, the state implementation plan, or you know, what people commonly refer to as the SIP. Uh, but it's uh, also used uh, to, you know, assess forward progress with respect to uh, air quality and. Uh, to satisfy the anti-backsliding provisions of the Clean Air Act. Thank you, Mike. Moving into the next section on who needs to report, and this is maybe the most important portion uh, of this presentation and knowing who actually needs to be concerned with this regulation. Um, as far as that, TAC states that accounts that meet the definition of a major facility stationary source as defined in subsection 116.12 and subsection 101.10. The second account that would meet and needs to report is ozone non-attainment areas emitting a maximum of 10 tons per year. TPY after this, VOCs, um, 25 TPY NOx or 100 TPY or more of any other contaminant subjects to NACs. The third category is emits 0.5 TPY of lead. Uh, 
The next account that would meet the definition emits or has the potential to emit 100 TPY or more of any contaminant except for greenhouse gases as listed in subsection 101.10 individually or collectively and you can flag that definition because the TCEQ has amended the rule um, concerning greenhouse gases being e exempted. Um, the next from excuse me from reporting uh, the next account is emits or has a potential to emit 10 TPY of any single or 25 TPY of aggregate hazardous air pollutants, those are commonly referred to as HAPs, as defined in the Federal Clean Air Act, subsection 112A1. And finally, the minor industrial source, area source, non-road mobile source or mobile source of emission emission subject to special inventories under subsection 10110B3. All right, Mike, those are quite the definitions. Can you give us some examples of what sectors uh, commonly or usually fall under these regulations? Oh, sure, Andy. Uh, and just to backtrack for a moment, um, it's important for you to determine whether or not you're in a non-attainment area. And there is a published map on the uh, TCEQ website to that effect. If you have any questions uh, after having reviewed that, please do give us a call. Uh, as far as uh, specific facilities, if they tend to be larger manufacturing facilities, uh, large combustion facilities like power plants, certainly uh, refineries, petrochemical plants, pulp and paper mills, cement uh, plants, and things of that nature. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Mike, Brandon, and Jennifer. Do either of you have um, some unusual emission inventory facilities that you've done? Hi, Andy. I'm kind of boring. I'm not sure I've had um, an unusual facility, but I have worked with uh, cement plants and the, all the moving parts that go along with those, um, paint booths for coating this operation, and then actually some large aggregate facilities, rock and uh, stone mining, do qualify when they uh, emit enough particulate matter, they will qualify for an emissions inventory. Hey, uh, yeah, I would say that I'm a little bit boring too as well. I have done a number of what I found exciting were some coal, very large coal power plants, some gas power plants. Um, I've done a number of compressor stations down pipelines midstream. Um, I've also, I have done a brewery. I guess that was pretty, pretty interesting to do as well. And once again, I'm I'm boring as well. Uh, although I have done uh, emission inventories for large vertically integrated pulp and paper mills, where you have not only paper making but uh, pulping and bleaching and. Uh, that tends to be uh, challenging as well as uh, the emissions associated with uh, very large wastewater treatment plants that are uh, part of those facilities. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, Brandon, can you, can you dive into if a facility has reported in the past and present day they, they, they no longer feel that they need to report, um, what should someone do if they feel they don't need to report any longer? Well, they need to still report what their actual emissions were. If it's a case in which, say, a unit has been taken offline, but they have not amended or voided that permit section, they still need to report zeros and for the previous year, for 2016, because technically it was still permitted. However, for future, it might be good to get in contact with a TCEQ or someone in order to like I said, to void that permit or amend that permit to say that that unit is no longer online, and the next year you won't have to you won't have to report it. Mike, can you comment on are there problems if you amend a permit or cancel a permit in a case like that? Oh uh, sure. Um, actually, uh, amending a permit is is somewhat distinct from canceling a permit. Obviously. Uh, uh, Amendments can be fairly complex or they can be you know, fairly straightforward depending on the nature of the amendment. 
uh, as far as canceling permits, uh, you want to take a real close business look at that. Uh, you want to make absolutely sure that uh, it's not you know, that a permit isn't in your business plan for you know reactivating a unit. Uh, we all know that NSR permits can take up to 18 months to get, uh, and then you have to go through public comment, which has its uh, own set of challenges. Uh, if your uh, facility is subject to prevention of significant deterioration or PSD, PSDs uh, can run as long as 24 months to three years. Excellent. Um, do you mind commenting also, Mike, on just normally what gets reported under emission inventory as far as chemical or classes of chemicals? Sure. Uh, basically, you're looking at your criteria air pollutants, which are NOx, SOx, uh, all three families of particulate matter, which is uh, particulate matter, uh, PM10, PM2.5, volatile organic compounds, which are ozone precursors, uh, hazardous air pollutants, and, uh, and lead. Perfect. Thank you. Um, looking at components of reporting, um, so reporting is for the calendar year January 1st through December 31st. Uh, reporting is due March 31st from the previous year. So reporting year you would uh, ten you would report 2016 on March 31st, 2017. Um, that might appear obvious, but uh, it's a true distinction. Uh, reporting is done through steers ultimately. And Brandon, do you mind, can you tell us more about the general components of reporting that is done through STEERS? Sure. You, for those of you who aren't uh, maybe familiar with STEERS and EIs, you, you have a lot of different information in there from your contact information for your whoever signs the final document. Um, you have locations of each emission source. Uh, you have maybe your emission controls um, within each individual. I mean, we'll get more in depth into all of this as we go, but but you have in there your hours of operation, your throughput, um, what's called emission factors um, to help you do all your calculations. Um, all of that's kind of put throughout. It's, it's pretty in depth for for the EI. So, so Jennifer, tell us. Uh, this is a popular question, I think, with folks if they are new at this or they haven't. They haven't prepared as much as they would have liked. Can you file for an extension with the TCEQ? Andy, unfortunately, you cannot file for an extension. The TCEQ won't allow for that. So that's why it's very, very important to have all your data sources prepared and know where everything comes from. Brandon, I know some folks um, tend not to like to have all of their info out in the open and how to do it how they do things. Um, is there a way to keep your information confidential? Uh, yes, there is. Um, starting about two years ago, the TCQ no longer allows you to submit your EIs on, through paper. You have to submit through STEERS. And as you're submitting, there's a section to include an attachment. Um, this attachment's where you would include your calculations. However, if you have any say proprietary information or anything you want to be confidential, the TCQ has, has stated basically they cannot keep it confidential by sending it through that portal. So they recommend submitting your calculations via snail mail uh, through the mail and, and have it stamped confidential. That way um, it's only for those that need to see it will see it. So the next uh, fun question here. Jennifer, if someone is not reported and should have reported, or they notice that they reported wrongly from a previous year, what would we advise them to do? One of the tools uh, in Texas is that Audit Privilege Act. So if you suspect that you should have reported and you did not, um, it, there's, there's plenty of rules along with the Audit Privilege. You have to, you can't, let's say, you can't know that you should have reported, you just have to suspect, and then you submit your letter to the TCEQ to go under audit privilege, and you perform that voluntary audit. And if you discover under that audit that you were supposed to have reported, you can uh, get protection under that act. And then 
I would also just recommend, especially when you report incorrect information, once you discover it, just talking with the TCQ. There's usually at least one or two sets of uh, emails and questions after you submitted the uh, emissions inventory. The TCQ will go through everything you've submitted, and they almost always have questions. So uh, just that keeping that line of communication open is very important. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, as far as uh, one point um, back to an amendment that is actually in the rule, again, if there were no emissions, um, you need to still report those, and we'll go back at the end of that. But um, Brandon, can you tell us um, with the TCEQ, are they particular about the way that they want EIs reported? Yes, they are. And if you'll go to the next slide, I can kind of go a little bit more in depth into it. Um, the TCEQ is very particular on using pathways. Um, as you see here, there's the three definitions of an FIN, a CIN, and an EPN. Uh, an FIN is your facility identification number. Um, basically, this is what at your facility creates the emission. Um, that can be a crusher, a stockpile, an engine, um, whatever is causing that emission. Um, you for sure, for this pathway, will always have an FIN and you'll have the EPN. Your EPN is going to be your emission point number. Um, that's going to be where the actual emission enters the atmosphere. Um, this could be a stack, a flare, um, a vent on top of a tank, something of that nature. Um, optionally, um, you have what's called a CIN, which is your control identification number. And this is basically your abatement source. Um, you have a bag house, a scrubber, a thermal oxidizer, something of that sort. When you're working in steers through your EI, the TCQ is very particular. You have to go in, you have to set your FIN, you have to connect it to your CIN, you have to connect it to your EPN. They want to make sure that they all line up. Um, you have to put in the exact coordinates of each and, and just show, show the pathway so they understand your facility a little bit better as to process and everything associated. And Brandon, you would end up um, submitting those pathways in uh, the documentation that you provide to the TCEQ later? Correct. The, the way the, the steers is set up, there's an actual drop-down menu in which you actually, one of the drop-downs is FIN, one of the drop-downs is CIN, one of the drop-downs is EPN, um, and you actually connect each of them throughout that. You have to say which ones they're connected before it even lets you go through and start entering the actual emissions data. Perfect. Thank you. Mike, can you tell us about some of the common control devices that are used in pathways and then obviously in real situations if they're in the pathways? Sure. Uh, you know, Brandon touched on some of them. You know, the typical things that we see with our clients are bag houses and cyclones for dust control. Uh, wet scrubbers uh, can also be used uh, for that type of application. If you have a very large combustion uh, source, like a uh, simple cycle turbine, or even a large recip engine, uh, sometimes though you see those with selective catalytic reduction. And if you have uh, operations that generate uh, volatile organic compounds or some classes of HAPs, uh, sometimes those are, are routed to a thermal oxidizer or something of that nature. Great. Thank you very much. Um, from the pathways, then, we go into actual emission calculations. Um, and so as far as emission factors go, um, emission factors are representative value that attempts to relate the quantity of a pollutant released to the atmosphere with an activity associated with the release of that pollutant. Mike, can you can you explain the different sources of information to get to the emission factors, and then can you also comment on on what those emission factors are and how they're 
used in the uh, calculations? Uh, the you know the slide uh, sets forth a very very rudimentary uh, generic approach to calculating actual emissions, uh, but you always want to make sure that uh, you select a correct emission factor. Uh, if, you know if it's a combustion uh, facility, you want to make sure that uh, you're using a natural gas em emission factor if that's what you're combusting, or if you have a a facility or a device that has the flexibility to burn, let's say, number two fuel oil and natural gas, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you do this emission calculation uh, with the uh, the correct runtime hours and the associated fuel throughput, things of that nature. Uh, the other thing is you want to make sure that uh, you thoroughly understand what the uh, capture efficiency uh, of a device might be, and by capture efficiency, I mean uh, a, a fume collection hood. Uh, that's uh, usually put over uh, like a metal cleaning operation, just in the way of example. And those obviously are not 100% uh, efficient. So what you would do is you would uh, estimate uh, what your total emissions uh, are, perhaps you know using a mass balance approach. And then assuming like a 95% efficiency for the capture device. So from that mass balance calculation, uh, you're actually only sending 95% of those emissions to the actual control device. And then the control device uh, will have its own efficiency, which is can be anywhere from 99% to uh, well, 95% to let's say you know four nines, that type of thing. But in terms of uh, resources to actually go and uh, look for these uh, emission factors, uh, probably the most well-known one is on the EPA website. It's called CHIEFS. It's the Clearinghouse for uh, Inventory Emission Factors. And I'm sorry, let me try that again. The Clearinghouse for Inventories and Emission Factors, that's where CHIEFS comes from. And actually, that's where AP42 is located. Uh, you can see that's referenced uh, up uh, further on the slide. I've also used uh, resources from like the California Air Resource Board and actually the individual air pollution control districts uh, in California. Uh, California used to be the leader in terms of uh, air pollution and, and the issues associated with those. Uh, they have very mature databases. Uh, the APCDs uh, that I've gone to or the websites are uh, Bay Area, San Joaquin, South Coast, uh, all very helpful uh, when you're doing this type of uh, work. But the key thing here is uh, no matter what emission factor you select, you want to make absolutely sure that you can document it and it will be acceptable to the regulatory agencies. Okay, Brandon, so once we get through the myriad of equations, what do we do with the actual emissions? Well, once we have that, we're going to go into SEERS and, and actually enter them. There's a, there's a drop-down, like I discussed earlier, and one is emissions. And from there, you have, you put in your throughput, you put in your emission rate, you also have to put in where you got your emission factor from. Um, whether it's a scientific calculation, an AP42, a vendor number, um, you put that in in order to calculate, um, to put in your actual calculation and show how you got that final actual emission. Perfect. Um, when we look at information to collect, to calculate emissions, uh, Brandon just touched on many of these, but material throughputs, operational hours, capture devices, efficiencies, control device efficiencies, estimating fugitive emissions. Jennifer, can you talk about record keeping and the importance of the record keeping and how some folks, you know, it, it's got to be pretty organized with this record keeping, it seems to me. That's right. Uh, obviously, your records are your most important piece of the emissions inventory because without your actual emissions from the year, you won't have anything to report. Um, so it's very, it's 
I try to make sure that the spreadsheet that you use for the um, inventory reflects your actual setup on site. You know, check and see, have you added any dust collectors that year? Have you added any flares? Have operations changed? Uh, there could be some updates you need to make to your emissions calculation spreadsheet to make sure you're showing what's truly on site. Um, and then your data sources, knowing where all your data comes from, because generally it's not just one source, whether it be calculations from AP42s or ASIMS data system, uh, or even vendor data. I know we've we've had to go pull data from vendors at the last minute, and they can be hard to get in touch with. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you have to have stack test or RADAs, make sure you have all those in one place and can access the uh, the data, the measurements from those. Um, and then when, if you are using an AP42 or some other emission factor from a source like the EPA website, just make sure you're using the latest data. Uh, so they do update those on occasion, uh, and you don't want to be using an emission factor from, you know, 1975 when it's 2017. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Um, Mike, can you describe uh, the information that folks should have concerning their capture device and their control device? Well, ideally, uh, you should have a filing cabinet someplace with all the engineering specs. Uh, and, you know, we, we both know that that doesn't happen. As Jennifer alluded to, uh, you know, we frequently uh, have to go hunting for that information on behalf of the clients. And, and that's just part of the service, you know, that we provide. Uh, the one thing that I did want to mention that's kind of a little bit of field of what we're discussing here today in terms of emission inventories is that you want to keep very, very good records with respect to how you maintain and operate that control device. Uh, those are records uh, and record keeping requirements that are frequently embodied in, in permits that you might have on your site. And in the unlikely event or the likely event that uh, you have a TCEQ inspector that comes to your facility, uh, that might be one of uh, the things that they might want to look at. Uh, pressure drops across uh, paint booth filters and how frequently you change those filters. Uh, same thing with uh, bag houses, uh, things of that nature. Yeah, we know how those filing cabinets go. Um, Brandon, when it comes to estimating fugitive emissions, can you give us some ideas on how to go about it and when these fugitive emissions occur? Sure. For, for those not familiar with the fugitive emission, um, you can get fugitive emissions from roads on your property um, in terms of dust. Um, you have stockpiles, perhaps. Um, there are drop places where maybe a front-end loader has a, a drop or a truck has a drop location of a material. Um, maybe you're transferring liquids and, and there's a vapor that comes off, um, maybe a leak, something like that. Um, a lot of these items are, they're very hard to quantify the exact amount. So rather than, than having an exact measured amount, there's uh, usually an emission factor um, sometimes it's AP42, but most of the time it's based on an established methodology that perhaps you used when you were creating your permit or um, that you use in order to, to enter that formula and on a yearly basis you calculate it that way. Perfect. So emission events then, um, any upset event or unscheduled maintenance, startup or shutdown activity um, Brandon, can you go into uh, why do they define an emission event um, as far as it goes into reporting? Sure. So an emission event is, uh, when it comes to, in terms of reportable, it's an unauthorized emission that's greater than or equal to the reportable quantity. Um, a lot of times you'll see this with maintenance, startup, and shutdown. Um, there's both reportable and non-reportable emission events. Uh, basically, it's when any time they go over their specified permitted amount for a period of time. When you go with TCEQ, there's actually an area in which you have to include these emission events and the numbers that you had, the number of reportable emission events you had throughout the year. Mike, can you tell us a little bit more about how folks should document emission events, and then 
why? Try to. Thanks, Mike. Um, as far as uh, SIMS versus uh, calculated emissions, um, when we I, I'm getting a message that we actually didn't hear what Mike said. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I'm gonna let him take another stab at answering. Um, the question was, can you tell us, tell us more about how folks should document emission events and why? Uh, certainly. Um, you want to document the nature of the event, uh, the duration, uh, how it occurred, uh, and actually you know, what you might want to be doing to mitigate uh, that eventuality at some point in the future. Uh, you should a absolutely have a system in place uh, where you collect all that information, a procedure. Uh, the last thing you want to do is try to go back and recall what happened a month after the event, two months, three months. If uh, you don't have that SOP in place, standard operating procedure, uh, we would uh, you know, be more than happy to uh, visit your facility and, and kind of walk you through that and, and develop that procedure. Perfect. Sorry about that glitch, folks. Um, Brandon, can you tell us why um, excess opacity events matter? Sure. So most facilities have a permitted level of opacity that they're allowed to have. Um, for those who don't know, opacity is going to be the amount of smoke coming out of your smokestack and how thick that smoke is. Um, for an, an excess opacity event that is defined as the total number of excess opacity is greater, your opacity is greater than 15% of your applicable opacity over a six minute average. Um, you see this a lot with, um, say you have, a, for example, a large power plant that has had a startup or shutdown. Perhaps there's a, a malfunction on the plant, something's gone wrong, and before they can shut it down, your control isn't working. There's some sort of inefficient combustion happening which uh, causes the smoke to come out. So they have to record that. They, they'll have someone train method nine to monitor that and it has to go into steers. Um, yeah. Perfect. Um, as long as you're on the phone still, Brandon, can you tell us more um, about SIMS versus calculated emissions and, and why those two things are they're different and why they matter? Sure. Uh, so SIMS data, um, for those who don't know, that's a continuous emission monitoring system. And that's basically a computer laser type uh, uh, piece of equipment that some, some companies uh, choose to put on. Some are required by their permit to put on their stack. And that the SIMS will take continuous uh, readings of the emissions coming out. And so when it comes time to do your emission inventory, you will put in an exact amount of what was put throughout the year. Um, I will say be sure that your SIMS hasn't had any errors or downtime. You need to continuously check that. We have had some issues with that, which we've had to go back and correct. Um, in terms of actual emission calculations, that's where we use your throughput, your emission factor, your hours run, and we'll actually calculate that out. So theoretically you should be getting the same answer with that, it's just two different ways in which to calculate your emissions for the year. 
Great. Thanks, Brandon. Jennifer, what are what are some things to keep in mind when using uh, SIMS data or when using a SIMS? So one of the main things, and it seems like it would go without saying, but it's just really important, is to make sure your team understands how the SIMS works and that it's programmed correctly and that the data it's reporting, uh, it's reporting in, the line, in lines with your permit, you've certified it, You've met. All, there's usually a bunch of different little tiny regulations that go along with having a SIMS at your plant. So it's just very important to make sure those things are programmed correctly or else you could be either over or under reporting your actual emissions. Great, thanks. And then I think we've covered, you know, the package submittal to the TCEQ. You, example calcs, uh, CGAs, RATAs, all of that information in the data package. Um, going into them. All right, so some changes to the rule or significant changes. And, um, I, you know, a lot of these are rule-based, uh, but some of these are also industry-based, and we wanted to, to talk about um, those a little bit. So uh, one is the, applic uh, the applicability threshold for lead has been lowered to 0 0.5 TPY. Um, section 10110A shortened the applicable distance for a site on waters from 25 miles to 9 nautical miles. That's 10.4 statute miles. Or if you get real into the rule, I think it's actually three leagues. Um, and I'm going to invite Jennifer to tell us more about why what's going on with this mileage and why that change happened. Well, basically, they were trying to adjust it to be consistent with the uh, juris jurisdictional waters for the state of Texas. So basically, the state of Texas border extends nine nautical miles out into the ocean. So that's what uh, TCQ has authority over. That's simple. Perfect. Thank you. Section 10110A4 was restricted to further clarify the greenhouse gases are excluded from the applicability determination. And then section 10110D2 required an owner or operator that submits an EI that had no emission events during the report year to include a certifying statement to this effect as part of the inventory. And I think we've, we've hinted on that a couple times. Um, you not only need to report, but there's also now a certifying statement. I guess they want to really know that you know that you were zero um, is, the, is the story there. Uh, the next two points are not um, changes to the rule, but they are significant changes in the industry. Um, water 9, which is used uh, a lot to estimate wastewater treatment plant emissions, uh, is being phased out. Um, Mike, can you tell us more about what's going on there and potential replacements? Well, I think the story there is the EPA finally figured out that they didn't want to be in the software business, but, uh, you know, that probably is a discussion for another time. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that about 18 to 24 months ago, EPA did announce that they would no longer be supporting Water 9. Uh, so as new operating systems come out for Windows, things of that nature, eventually the, the Water 9 software will become incompatible and un, unusable, if you will. There are uh, some replacements for that. Uh, the one that we have selected is uh, a uh, software package called ToxChem. Uh, it's uh, fairly user-friendly, but there are some nuances uh, with respect to using the software. Uh, that's uh, you know so if if you have a wastewater treatment plant uh, and you and you have these issues, we can certainly help you uh, get up set up in Toxchem, as well as uh, we can start translating uh, the associated database that you may have used in Water Nine, uh, so that uh, it will be compatible with uh, the Toxchem fate and transport software. So then the last point, Tanks 4.0 is also being phased out. Um, and, and Brandon, you want to tell us more about why that is and, and how to deal with that? Yes. So in talking on TCQ, I think there is some discussion about 
some of the accuracy involving tanks 4.0 I think they they don't fully agree with some of the methodology but um, one of the biggest problems is that tanks 4.0 does not take into account any heated tanks um, there's not there's not a section anywhere or a button you can click to enter a heated tank information so um, a lot of people are are switching to different programs right now a good example would be ENP tanks um, as well as just trying to calculate it yourself through through um, the methodology now obviously that's a lot a lot harder than putting it into the program but it it could be more accurate and it can take into account the heated tanks so as far as some common problems that we see in the emissions inventory before I go through the list I'm gonna I'm gonna invite all three of our experts to comment on if they have uh, problems that they've seen or they've encountered um, and I think a couple of them are going to be on this list. Um, Mike, you want to want to jump in and tell us about some of the problems you've seen with emission inventories? Well, you know, I, I think you know historically, the you know the biggest issue I've seen is simply not allowing enough time to uh, actually develop the the EI and get it through a company's review process. Um, you know, we're all guilty of procrastination, and probably I'm the biggest offender. But uh, you know, I've I've seen folks come to us, uh, you know, two weeks before the deadline. Uh, they haven't assembled their information, and still they they want to get it uh, in under the, the March 31st deadline. You know, through six layers of, of corporate review, and uh, you know that that just gets to be uh, downright challenging. Um, so you know the moral of the story here is that the uh, the sooner that you can begin to pull your information together in anticipation of that deadline and 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 get the process underway, the the better everyone is, uh, better off it is for everybody. Perfect, Jennifer. What problems do you commonly see, or what are the ones that that drive you batty? One of the simplest pieces of it is just signing the thing when it's done, uh, you would think. But if your responsible official does not have a steers account or, you know, we have turnover a lot of times and we have a different plant manager who's going to sign off on this emissions inventory when it's due, uh, if you have a Texas state ID, it's real simple. You can register your account in steers and use your Texas ID number and do all that online in one day and it's, you can then go sign your emissions inventory. But if for some reason your corporate office is in North Carolina or, you know, Oregon or somewhere, if um, that responsible official has to log into STEERS to sign, they will have to print out and mail the uh, signature page to get their STEERS account set up and get them set up as the signatory authority on that emissions inventory. So uh, honestly, making sure your responsible official is registered and current in STEERS is one of the very first steps I would take before starting your emissions inventory. Perfect. Um, Brandon, what about you? What are, what are some problems that you've seen over the years? I'm kind of going along with what Jennifer said. I, I would also check to make sure that your computer is compatible with STEERS. I've, I've seen where people don't have the right Internet Explorer or something like that, and they aren't able to log in, which, you know, of course, you know, they've come to us late, and they aren't logged into STEERS, and it, it causes a big stress. So I, I usually recommend, I mean, you can go in today and get logged in and get your STEERS account set up so that you can go forward. and. And since we have a couple months, I mean, that's perfect timing versus being stressed at the last minute. Um, I've also, uh, other examples, I guess, I've seen, we've gone to facilities before where uh, perhaps they had a stack test that year, which will give them a new emission factor, and they can't find that stack test. Um, so they have to contact their their stack tester to mail it. And again, um, going all in mic, if you've waited too late to set this up, that just adds a lot more stress. Um, and and adds a lot more that we have to do and you have to do in digging through your files and your file cabinets and closets to find it. Um, I, I would also say there's been issues with, um, in terms of, of collecting data, um, I've had facilities where they have to manually record their throughputs and hours every day and someone went on vacation for a month or someone quit and the new person wasn't trained and so suddenly they've got months of data that weren't recorded or were reported recorded but weren't compiled and so 
someone has to then sit there with something that normally could have been done five minutes every day or at the end of the week. They have to sit there for a couple of days and do all the calculations and all the compiling in order to get us the, the throughputs and hours that we need in order to, to process the final emission inventory. So it sounds like from our panel of experts, there's a big part with procrastination not being a good thing. Um, some of the other common things with pro that are problematic is wrong paths. Um, you know, the responsible official sign-off, and, and, you know, really this is a responsibility side thing, and, and you know, um, that official having some time to review and making sure they're comfortable and happy um, is a pretty good thing. Um, you know, EI corresponds to other reports as well. So um, if you don't have matching um, reporting levels that, that that could be problematic for you in the future. Um, make sure your emission factors make sense. Um, you don't want to over-report, you don't want to under-report, you, you'd like to be the middle bear and have everything, your Goldilocks and have everything just right. Um, and then it, it, we've hit on training and record keeping requirements. Um, a little bit of training and checking through the year really helps. Uh, moving on, so the TCEQ hosts an emission inventory workshop. That is next week. It's January 25th, 2017. They do that in Austin, and you can sign up on their website. The uh, website page is below, and actually um, Mike Faudry and, and Brandon Clayton for w &M will be there, so if you get a chance, say hi to them, um, pull them over and chat with them. Uh, that's another chance if you have weedy questions that you want to get down into the details, they could go into them with you. Uh, you're also welcome to reach out to them. Uh, some resources, so here's where the TAC rule is. Um, the TCQ actually has a pretty good frequently asked questions page um, with this. Uh, the 2016 emission inventory guidelines, that's 240 pages of your favorite reading that you can take a look at and uh, read through on specifics of the emission inventory. Um, I've re-put the emission inventory workshop on this page. Again, that's in Austin, January 25th. And then uh, the chief site that Mike referred to with the emission factor resources, or sorry, the emission factors resource uh, is at the bottom. Uh, finally, I want to invite you to uh, attend our next webinar, which is Tips on Environmental Reporting, that will cover annual waste summaries, air emission inventory, stormwater, TRI, Tier 2s, uh, many other things. You can register for that, um, and Ms. Heather Woodward will be providing it. Uh, it's January 26th from 11.30 to 12.30. Uh, you can sign up on our website, uh, www.wh-m.com, and it's under Events. Finally, thanks for joining, and I understand that we have a question um, from the audience. Uh, Lance, are you on? Uh, yeah, I'm here, uh, Andy. It's, uh, Amy asked, um, what about fertilizer storage and loading plants related to agriculture? So um, maybe we'll have Mike jump in on that. Fertilizer um, related to agriculture, so storage of fertilizers, uh, do those fall into the emission inventory? You would actually have to take a look uh, and see, you know, what your emissions, your actual and potential emissions were, uh, probably for a particulate matter. Uh, so, you know, you you do the calculations with respect to, you know, the amount of material that uh, you processed through the facility in 2016, and see if you tripped any of the uh, applicability thresholds for uh, particulate matter that we mentioned earlier this afternoon. Well, and Amy, if that isn't totally clear, you are welcome to reach out to, to any of the experts and, and pick their brains a little more, and we can take a look at that. Um, Lance, do you have any other questions that have come in? Um, yeah, one more just came in. What about the methane emissions from coal mining? How can we account them? 
I am looking at uh, my experts and seeing which one would like to answer coal mining and methane, and is, is that applicable to the emission inventory? I think Mike's going to take this one. Mike, got ideas? Uh, methane is, is actually a greenhouse gas, and uh, greenhouse gases are uh, not subject to the rule, and, and they're not subject to EI reporting. So that would be my initial take on that. Perfect. Any others, Lance? Nope, that's it. Great job, guys. Okay. I want to thank everybody for attending today. Again, we realize this is a, a pretty high overview for some of you true emission inventory veterans. If you have other questions, please reach out to, to Mike or Brandon or Jennifer, and I, I they can definitely get uh, more specific with you. Uh, again, we appreciate everybody attending today. Thanks, and have a great rest of your week.